Ireland possesses a mythic heritage that in its abundance and its character is unique in Western Europe. And yet today, myth, legend and folklore lie at the margins, irrelevant and largely ignored. The very word myth has come to mean a lie or an untruth. For many people, the age of myth is well and truly over. The gods and heroes of the past are now replaced by theology and by the logic and reality of science, commerce and progress. For many, the myths are part of the past. Superstition, backwardness and an impoverished history. So why then might we revisit this mythic heritage? Why should we engage with those stories that have stood the test of time? Compared to logic and argument, stories work in a different way. They work with enchantment and emotion. They find places in the heart. They act as a mirror of our desires. They shape our culture and they define who we are. They are central to how we live in the world. And for many, how we live in this world is not sustainable. We may need to challenge the stories that we live by. There are good reasons why myth, legend and folklore are worth revisiting. They are timeless stories that have always had the ability to entertain. They have been a guide and inspiration to individuals, communities and indeed nations. They are particularly relevant at times of dislocation and disruption. Myths, as one folklorist puts it, have uncanny powers of self-definition. So how do we relate to these stories today, given that they often seem strange and mysterious to a modern ear? It's easy to dismiss these stories as nonsense, as fantasy. So if one of the characters is turned into a fly by a jealous stepmother and blown away by fierce storms, do we dismiss the story? Or do we recognize that maybe this is a way of describing an inner reality? And if we hear a story of a vain and greedy king who treats a great poet with disdain and cruelty, the story of the poet Carbra, who stood before the throne of the unjust King Brez, and with words of withering satire deposed him of his kingship, do we dismiss this as ridiculous? Or do we connect this story with those in high places today? The meaning of folklore and myth lies just below the surface, and getting to this meaning is a journey of discovery. Our ancestors would humanize what they were experiencing emotionally and spiritually. The story may not be literally true, but perhaps that's not the point. Encoded in the imaginary world of myth is a wisdom potentially of great value to us today. When we look at Ireland's heritage, it is important to distinguish between mythic stories and ancient history. The ancient history of Ireland is what historians and archaeologists create. They build a picture of the past from separate pieces of information to establish the facts of history. The mythic history and heritage is of a different nature. When Christianity arrived in Ireland around the 5th century AD, Ireland already possessed a rich mythological tradition. It concerned the gods, such as the Dian. He was a larger-than-life character, huge and hospitable, with a club that could kill or cure, and a cauldron that never emptied. 
Zadaya was the great father god of the Irish. The knowledge, experience and wisdom of the people became attached to many semi-divine kings, warriors, poets and prophets, all of whom reflected reality in the social order. The Christian religion, on the other hand, had its own system of belief and ritual. It was attached to God, angels and saints. Before Christianity could become accepted, the influence of the native gods and heroes had to be diminished. By turning the characters and events of existing myth into a colorful combination of imagined or fanciful history. Throughout the Middle Ages, the native Irish mythology was augmented using material from the Bible and from classical literature. And the creative minds who did this didn't hesitate to add in their own contribution of alluring fiction. They didn't worry too much about accuracy or the real meaning behind information they uncovered. To them, the imagination presented a glorious past, bathed in adventure, where godlike beings inhabited Ireland and made it notable. They imagined and reproduced a great, fanciful story of the past. One in spirit with them, this is the story we will tell, of its first men and women. These stories may be strange and unfamiliar, but they are part of what makes us who we are. In this ancient history told through myth, first to arrive was the land goddess Cassir. Some say she was Noah's granddaughter and came to Ireland with 50 women and three men, one of whom, Fionton, broke her heart as he fled. The first man was not a warrior like Hu Hullin, or indeed an outlaw like Fionn Machuil. No, the first man of Ireland was a shaman, Fionn Machbochna, a wise man, a guardian of soul, of individual and community. It was this same Fionn that Cassir loved. The fact that he was a shaman connects us to a tradition that has echoes in the frozen north from Siberia to the oldest known inhabitants of Finland, the Laps, and on to the Inuits of Canada. In these very old tales, we have other intriguing characters and stories. We have Parhalon, the first Irish entrepreneur who was also a shaman. He brought cattle to Ireland and set up the first dairy farm, brewed ale for the enjoyment and delight of the people, and was the man who gave us the first law court. And then there was Neva and his red-haired wife Macha, land and war goddess and seer. He cleared the forests of Ireland to create 12 fertile plains. If he were here today, Neva would plant forests. We also have the hobbit-like Fear Bullock, the bagmen of mythic Ireland. Simple, honest people who just did a good day's work. And yet, in spite of their simplicity, we have a people with great political savvy. It was the Fear Bullock who gave us the five provinces. While the fifth, Cuigan, no longer exists, it suggests a wonderful ambiguity in the four that is five, a place of more than, a place of reconciliation and kingship. The heart of the fifth province, the Hill of Ishnach, the ancient seat of the kings, is here in County Westmeath. Then, from the north, in a red mist, came the second great culture at the heart of this imagined past. This was the Tuatha Dé Danann, the people of the goddess Danu, who came with their four magical gifts, the cauldron that never emptied, 
the spear that guaranteed victory, the sword from which no one escaped, and the stone that announced the rightful king. Danu was the goddess of the Celts, who was called the mother of Irish gods, and that's saying something. Danu gave her name to great rivers of Europe, the Danube and the Don. In Ireland, near Killarney, two sacred hills, the Paps of Danu, honour her in the landscape. Here we have a way of life that existed before the Celts, a goddess culture centered on a cycle of birth, death and regeneration and of a matriarchal social order. The idea of a pre-patriarchal culture has fired the imagination of many. This is what the prehistorian Maya Gimbutas would call Old Europe, the culture before the Celts arrived. In Ireland for a visit in 1989, she spoke admiringly of the country's rich cultural heritage and that, quote, the old European monuments stand here in all their majesty. These monuments were the wonderful megaliths of Newgrange, They also included the dolmens, such as Labby Rock in Sligo. The rock bed on which, as legend would have it, the lovers Dearmwyd and Gronje would sleep and love while being pursued by the angry Fionn Macuil. In the mythological history, it was the outcome of two great battles, the Battles of Moitira, that established the megalithic goddess culture in Ireland. It was the second great battle between the Tua de Danann and the fearsome leader of the Favoira, Balar of the Evil Eye. During the battle, the Favore stole the great harp of Ireland, a harp called Harmonize Us to All Things. A harp that was the music of Ireland, the soul of Ireland. Though the Thua de Danann eventually won that second battle of Moitira against Balor, it was at a great cost. Some would say we have lost the third battle of Moitira to a totally materialistic worldview to a soulless modernity. In the mythic tradition, we learn that the Tua de Danann were eventually defeated by the Miletians and the Gwales at the Battle of Taltu. It was this defeat and the arrival of the Sons of Mill, and particularly Avergan, that brought Celtic culture to Ireland. And from that day on, from that sad day, the people of the goddess retreated underground to grave mounds and other lonely places. The Battle of Taltu for philosopher and mythologist John Moriarty was, quote, an infinitely sadder word than can sail. A cultural disaster, worse even than the coming of the Vikings, worse than the coming of Cromwell and his roundheads. Taltu was defeat for the language of megalith builders. Defeat for a way of seeing and knowing the world. Welcome to a journey into probably the richest oral and folkloric tradition in the world. <laughs>